very good morning, gentlemen. Good to have you right here. Uh, we can see there's one man who hasn't uh, chosen to wear a black suit, so we'll put him in the dock first. Shankar, we'll start with you and your presentation to kick off the day's sessions. Thanks. Our uh, topic for this morning is creating compelling brand experiences, amplifying your consumer's emotional connect with your brand, and locking in brand loyalty through prepaid and gift card programs is one of the manifestations of loyalty. In the prepaid paradigm, I'd like to say, consumers pay upfront and trust the brands with their money for services or products that they avail of at a later stage. Prepaid, in that sense, is a self-propelled, lucrative value proposition for any brand. And I would say that it is arguably one of the strongest forms of loyalty that one can experience. It's true, because, I mean, why would you pay for something if you didn't believe in it? Branding is probably as old as mankind. Yesterday, it was in the form of a mass tribal movement towards their tribal totems. Today, it's about our consumers and our obsession with brands. Between then and now, the only thing that's really common is that brands continue to remain totems and create a fan following. Creating a consumer movement towards one's brand, we've sort of classified them into at the highest level, a brand can transcend itself to become a love mark, which means high love and high respect. And at the lowest level, it's a product with low love and low respect. This is basically the source of me, Kevin Roberts, a very interesting book called Love Marks. The holy grail of branding, as far as most of us marketeers are concerned, would be taking the leap from, becoming, uh, from being just a brand into becoming a love mark. It's, uh, it's a consummation, as they say, devoutly to be wished. The consumer journey in relation to a brand, typically, the consumer is a prospect, then he becomes a customer, the customer becomes a satisfied customer, moves on to becoming a loyal customer, and then creates, uh, becomes a complete advocate, and then probably uh, gets into things like prepaid. Loyalty, per se, has many manifestations, an intent to purchase right up to the, the position where the consumer pays a premium price. But I still maintain that a consumer paying upfront is probably the strongest measure of loyalty ever. Prepaid and gift cards, we believe, inspire loyalty. They create choice for the consumer. They multiply sales and they generate cash. Just a little earlier, we were having this discussion with Abhishek Maheshwari on the panel. It was an off-the-cuff discussion where he said this is probably the only um, business which is, uh, which is basically cash flow positive. It generates cash for the brand. There is no cost attached to it in that sense. Gifting, per se, is a supersized business opportunity. Gift cards uh, actually contribute a large chunk to the gifting market. Gifting probably accounts for more than 15% of the total retail market in the United States and the United Kingdom, with gift cards accounting for over 25% of that. This product has actually stood the test of time. The share of gift cards and gift vouchers are growing year on year on year. Some of the leading retailers in India, including you know, the likes of Shopperstop and Lifestyle, all of whom we are familiar with, actually experience 10 to 12% of their top line being contributed through prepaid and gift cards. So we argue that this business is probably one of the strongest cash flow businesses you can probably look at from a businessman's point of view. The Indian market, we believe, is coming of age. We have actually seen the progression over the last, say, four years. We've seen the way that the market has improved. We've seen the way that gift cards are slowly taking over the psyche of the consumer from a gifting perspective. Consumers really love certain things about prepaid and gift cards, would be gifting flexibility, a very subtle nudge towards loyalty, and of course, the freedom of choice and convenience. Brands, I mean, ultimately, we are all in some sense in the business of brands. Um, they experience a sales multiplier where every gift card sold brings in two customers. The brand achieves advanced cash flows through gift card sales. Consumer loyalty and retention because once a consumer has prepaid, there is a significant lethargy in moving to another brand. Gift cards would also contribute increased revenue, and it can become an omni-channel brand currency. It can be used online, it can be used in the physical retail, it can be used pretty much anywhere where the brand is present. There's another 
unsung hero which is called breakage. Breakage is the sum of uh, money which is unredeemed in those gift cards. There is a straight infusion into the bottom line from a brand perspective. Many different forms of gift and prepaid. They would be right from a physical gift voucher to a plastic card going on to a mobile uh, e-gift card or a mobile gift card, mobile voucher even. Today, our company, Quicksilver, actually powers around 90% of the gift cards sold in the Indian market. We believe some of these things to be the, ro the road ahead. Newer channels of purchase are ever becoming present. Things like uh, today, mobile access, um, Consumers use the mobile to access the internet a great deal. One of the reasons being you have fantastic 3G services and with probably when Reliance comes in with its 4G services, the world will change once again. Um, all this holds a lot of promise for mobile-based gifting applications because it's all about reaching the product to the consumer in the most seamless possible way. This is about it. The power of choice is yours. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Shelley. And... Uh... My dear colleagues, uh, I'm going to be speaking for seven minutes and what I'm going to speak to you is uh, going to be on the subject of creating brand experiences. And uh, since it's seven minutes, uh, please accept these uh, seven thoughts that I'm going to present to you as seven tweets uh, because in, to do justice in one minute to one thought is not possible. So a lead presentation is actually meant to ostensibly lead and therefore I'm going to present seven lead thoughts, some contentious, some not, uh, but whatever is contentious we'll possibly discuss across in the panel later. So the first one, my first tweet, uh, locking in brand loyalty. Uh, brand loyalty as a term itself is very worrisome for me. Those of you who believe in the term brand loyalty uh, I do believe you need to jolt yourself into action and appreciate the fact that brand loyalty in its absolute form does not exist. Brand loyalty is so 2012 a concept. Today is 2014. Uh, society is more promiscuous than loyal. Loyalty is old. Promiscuity is the new reality. Pop into your pockets. Pick out those 11 hotel loyalty program cards, pop into your pockets, pick, in, pick out those seven shoppers uh, loyalty programs, and it can go on and on. And at the end of the day, when I travel by an airline, I travel by any airline, because at the end of the day, in any case, I've got a loyalty card from that airline, I will anyway get a point, and who knows, in the future, there might be a point aggregator coming in who might actually help me go ahead. So point one, tweet one, Loyalty is so 2012. Point two. Uh, tweet two. The brand is a service. The brand certainly is a service, which simply means to say that the products are dead today. The coffee that you buy out in the retail market, when you take it home, you actually create a service out of it. The way you open the packet, the way you sensuously dip in the spoon into the packet and take out the coffee, the way you smell the coffee powder before actually dipping it into a cup of hot water, the way you golify it, the way you actually take the cup and keep it close to your nostrils and smell it, and the way you drink it, and the quantum that you put in it. Actually, every product is no longer a product, it's a service. And that service is what you pay for, and you pay immensely for it. It's the experience, stupid, is my second tweet. It is the experience, and all brands are about experiences. Tweet three, brands go generic. This is a trend that I've been tracking, where in the older days, brands were specific defined offerings, very specific defined offerings, not anymore. Brands today are generic. Brands are macro. Look at Apple. Apple doesn't talk to you about the 2,650 features of an iPhone. Apple does not even showcase one feature of the iPhone and talk about it. Apple is an ethos. Apple is an umbrella. In fact, the bigger brands are generic, whereas smaller commodities are specific. Think about it. Tweet three. Tweet four. Retailers are product and service aggregators. If you are a retailer, you are nothing more than a product and a service aggregator. Guess what? 
every tom dick and harris offers you the very same product assortment that every other guy offers you okay what is it that you offer differently as a retailer you as a retailer possibly it's like cooking everybody makes sambar in the house i come from bangalore and i'll talk about my sambars everybody makes sambar in the house but every house sambar is different in taste why so they say that dash of love of who cooked it and guess what the same thing applies to a retailer every retailer stocks the same assortments and everybody has the same the only difference is that bit of love and love in this case which you add that dash of love and that dash of love that you add is essentially the service that you offer so service is the differentiator tweet 5 the brand is a story the brand is a story every brand is a story i it's a story i like to read again and again and again and again if i go to shopper stop if i want to go back to shopper stop again it must be a story i like so much i love so much that i want to go back to shopper stop again and again and again never mind how far it is if i walk into a kidzenia i will want to go again and again and again uh or will i is the question if i want to go again and again and again it's like i wanting to read that book again and again and again a brand is a book look into your lives which is that one book which you want to read again and again and again and again and why i haven't found too many the bible the quran the gita do we have learnings think about it and therefore it's a difficult proposition tweet 6 prepaid and gift cards are forced lock-ins beautiful thing to do because you know you force people into locking in their money in advance with a discount hopefully right up front and get them into that particular outlet so everything is prepaid because all of us know credit is a very bad word in the market prepaid is a great word to go do they work we need to discuss because prepaid has an element of force in it has an element of pre-force in it and we will discuss it in a little detail as we go that's tweet 6 and tweet 7 the last tweet is clean practice branding you know i think all of us need to forget all the old pieces of branding we've been used to we need to invent new pieces of branding and one of the theories i'm working on is called clean practice branding so i'm going to very quickly conclude in the next one minute talking about what is clean practice branding i discovered clean practice branding about 5 years ago when i was on a trip to italy I walked into a coffee shop. I love coffee. I ordered a cup of coffee there. And when I paid out for the coffee, I flinched because the cup of coffee actually costed the equivalent of 360 Indian rupees. I'm a total desi. Every time I spend my money in any currency, I convert it into Indian rupee. Okay? And I said 360 rupees. I was about to pay at the counter, and the counter guy looks at me and says, "Sir, would you like to suspend a coffee?" Suspend a coffee? I said I've been a corporate person for long numbers of years. I worked with many people. I've never ever suspended a person. Why would I suspend a coffee? Now the guy looks at me and says, "Sir, it is a concept." The moment he says it's a concept, my antennae rise. And I look and he says, "You are a rich man." I say, "No, I'm not." He says, "You are." I said, "Why? You come from India." I say, "India is a poor country." He says, "No, you took a flight from India. If you can pay for a flight from India, you must be a, to Italy. You must be a rich man." Okay, I'll accept that. and then he says you are capable of buying not one cup of coffee in my shop but two i said yes if i came in with somebody i would buy another cup of coffee he says if you can buy two cups of coffee why don't you buy two cups of coffee i tell him i haven't come with anyone he says imagine pretend you came with someone i said what do you mean he says this is the concept of suspended coffee he points me to a board which is facing the outside of his shop and he is there it's written suspended items there's a croissant there's a donut there are cappuccinos lattes all with tick marks tally marks different tally marks he says if you buy you paid for one coffee you pay another 360 indian rupees equivalent of mine and in that case i will suspend one coffee for you out there what happens he says italy is a poor country i said nonsense we in india know better He says Italy is a poor country. Poor people who cannot afford a cup of coffee, who walk by my store, look in and say what's suspended. They come in and ask for one suspended item. One person is eligible to claim one suspended item, and I will give your suspended coffee to him. What do I get? I ask. 
because what's in it for me? He says blessings, consumer blessings. His blessings will come to me. And again, I'm selfish. How do I know that it'll come to me? No, sir. It's the old Kainat concept of India, the Eastern concept. You put into the universe something, it comes back to you. Guess what, guys? I've spun off an entire religion on this thought, and I work with 11 companies overseas and three companies in India trying to create what I call inclusive branding, what I call clean practice branding. Businesses across the world, retailers across the world have gotten corrupted. Time to clean up the act, and I think it's a great new way of branding. With that, thank you, my seven minute plus. Thank you. Certainly we've got uh, two completely different sides uh, of how we're going to look at uh, brand experiences. One in terms of the deliverables that Shankar was talking about and changing the idea of loyalty and experience and one that Harish talked about where it's a lot about consumer extrapolation and understanding some of those um, well, ideas up in the air. So there's plenty for us to pick and choose from and we will take that forward. Um, this document in front of me here say something that I wasn't aware of, and I, I claim to be a very smart retail reporter at one stage. It says a segment of consumers specifically believe that only 5% of brands make their lives notably better, and that these consumers couldn't be bothered if nearly 92% of these brands around them completely vanished. Now that certainly is a far cry from consumer blessings consumer experiences and brand loyalty. So let's pick these and take them forward. Abhishek, let's start with you. Give us an idea of these great expectations that consumers have today from brands and can brands meet them? No, I think it's, it is a revealing, uh, revealing insight that uh, you know, when, you re when really push comes to a shove, consumers are really truly only valuing 5% of the brands. And I think some of the things that, uh, that Harish said make a lot of sense. And I think it is really when, whenever a brand is able to transcend some of these things that they get into that top 5%. You know, there are a lot of brands, and I think the, the, the matrix that you showed, there are a lot of brands that are backed, you know, that are a fad at a point in time because they produced a great product or something that's worked at that point in time. But then can they transcend that? And can they go from there to, you know, to the next level, create, you know, experiences, create stories, all of that. And you know, I, I work for uh, for the Walt Disney Company, so I'll just take you know I'll just take do a you know a few seconds of self indulgence. But I think Disney is a brand that over a very long period of time has been able to transcend that. At least we like to believe that, and everything that we hear uh, sort of points to that fact. And you know, it is a brand. You you mentioned you know your point number five was that brand is is a story. I think a lot of brands aspire to sort of start from a point and then become a, become this great story and the great experience. I think the advantage that we at Disney had is that we started with a story. Right? Disney is all about it. It is fundamental foundation of, you know, who are we as a company? It's, you know, it's not a theme park. It's not a product. It's not a TV channel. It is a story. You know, we are, you know, the company's foundation is based on storytelling and on creating characters that frankly can transcend generations. And they've been able to do that over a very, very long period of time. Having said that, it is always, you know, any brand is, is built on, on the back of extremely successful products and experiences. And that's really, uh, I think that's really where, you know, a lot of brands sort of need to get to, right? From a single product or a single uh, experience, how do, you, how do you become a part of a customer's, you know, life where, you know, they, they value it above and beyond, you know, you mentioned the, the point of Apple, right? Above and beyond that, you know, that touch feature or what have you. I just want to buy the next Apple. Would you, say, would you say, Abhishek, that given how storied your own brand has been, you too feel that pressure of the need for changing brand experience, the need to be up to speed with some of the ideas both uh, Shankar and Harish talked about. Is a brand as big as Disney, uh, with, with that kind of a background as well, wondering what the future glory would be? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, I, I do agree that, you know, uh, whether sort of, whether brand loyalty is the correct word or not is for the consultants of the day to decide. But the fact is that, you know, consumer expectations are constantly increasing. So as a brand or as an experience or as a product, you need to consistently innovate. And I think we try to do that. You always have to, you can never take a customer for guarantee. For, you know, uh, I, I bet you that out of the 92 brands that customers don't care about today, yeah. at some point they probably did. And, you know, brands fall off that grid very, very quickly. Okay. And I think so it's, it is important to consistently innovate, you know, however storied your brand might be. Because, you know, 
you're as good as your last story or your last product success. That's true for everyone. Product. You're as good as your last success. Okay, Sanjeev, let me bring you in. You represent Kidzania. Give us an idea about the very fact that it's, it's often harder to get a new customer in than to retain one. But off late, even retaining that customer has become as hard as acquiring a brand new one. How do you try and do that balancing act for a product like Kidzania or an experience like Kidzania, which has been around for what, 12 months in India? And it's, you know, you need to now start thinking how to take it from one city to multiple cities. Thank you. We have a slightly a different sort of uh, experience in Kidzania. Globally, the average is a customer comes back 3.8 times in a year because of two basic reasons. We believe that the difficult part is to get the customer to come to Kidzania the first time because it's a concept which is very difficult to explain either by a print media or by a hoarding or by any conventional means because it's all about empowerment of children, a city for children created for them so it's a compelling band experience. It's also an emotional context. It's all about the experience that the child has. And since it's like a city, it's like you go to a Paris, you want to go again because you have not covered all the sites of the city. So similarly in Kidzania, a child cannot cover everything in the first time. And he definitely does come back the second time. In addition, we have a variety of other, uh, I would say, products. We have a Kidzania passport program where every time a child comes back, he gets certain other incentives, which is a global program. Means you can go to Kidzania in Moscow, London, Dubai, or Jakarta, and you can get points, which basically makes sure that any time he goes again, he gets rewarded based on the number of times that he has visited. So it's all about a compelling experience. It's all about a big Kidzania experience, which he gets through a passport program, which elevates him based on the similar to a frequent flyer, but elevates his status every time he comes back. And most important for us is that he believes it's his own city, and he, in fact, becomes a brand ambassador for us as to others. How central to this has been the idea of emotional connect? I mean, some of you dropped the word emotion earlier, but I'd be very curious to know, how do you try and define that, uh, you know, in terms of your approach towards your customer? What is the emotional piece that you work on and does it deliver the numbers for you? Yes. Emotional content in here is based on two things. Let's go back to the founder of this concept, a person called Javier Ancona, who gave up his high five job to say, I want to make a concept which empowers children to make the world a better place. So for everything that we do, at the core is to make the world a better place for the children and for the generations to come. It could be as simple as environment. It could be as simple as empowerment. It could be as thing as, you know, social integration. So everything we do has a basically social theme with the concept of make the world a better place. So there is an emotional connect, connect to the child and to every visitor which comes to Kidzania. Okay. Um, Akshay Sethi of Stella Children's Museum. Let's, let's focus now on how do brands gain these insights? I mean, we do know there is a task up ahead. We know that we need to get loyalty in place, experiences in place. But how can brands get the insights to actually be on the right track with respect to their own product or service or brand? Um, I think data, right? So the, the more data that you can collect, the more surveys that you can do, the better informed you are. Uh, we do, um, and that could be used technology. So you can have, again, you could have a card system that every time you have to use a card to enter and so that you collect the data. Um, or it could be the old-fashioned surveys. Um, we see, for example, we keep collecting data to see how many times visitors have come back so that we can track the, the footfalls. We also have a membership model. And so membership cards are actually very valuable from a data point of view. Uh, because they tell you how many times the, the customer has come back, um, the child has come back for the experience. So that's one way of getting inside. The other, of course, is um, using you know, social media as well uh, to figure out what's happening about your brand. What are people saying about your brand? Uh, TripAdvisor, Facebook, you know, just see what is it that the people are saying about your brand so that you can encourage loyalty. So that's right. You know, some, some would say the idea of data has been 
long a business model which people are still trying to figure out because everybody wants data and the consumers also figure this out and they still wonder okay how many companies are getting data and how many of them can seriously put it to work yeah. do you think that that's where some challenges lie for even brands like yours absolutely i mean at the start point of data is that someone needs to give information and you know convincing someone to give you their phone number or your email address is always a challenge uh, and I don't see it being a challenge specific to India I think it's across countries across the world it's a challenge so that really is the biggest key point and if we can help come up with strategies or technologies that will allow in the most discreet fashion to collect this information then we're going to have a winning edge so I'll pick two uh, phrases there, discrete fashion and old fashioned that you talked about. So Harish, you know, we earlier talked about the idea of um, somehow the word, words old fashioned fit in there pretty well because, you know, people are finally realizing after all this rigmarole of past two decades of, you know, being flashy footfalls, you've got to just come back to exactly where you started, which is your service. And then he talked about discrete. You know, one side the consumer wants everything in their face. And on the other hand, we're talking about discrete. So how do we work the two around? Okay, you see, first of all, one of the biggest disasters of modern retail is footfalls. We don't have enough footfalls. I mean, you know, the very small number of outlets in each of the categories actually have footfalls. Uh, creating footfalls is, uh, the first footfall is fine, but then repeat footfalls is what we're talking about. So when I hear that Kidzania gets uh, such good repeats, I'm totally thrilled and excited. It's a great thing. So what do you, what's it about? It's about creating those experiences. And it's about, you know, doing it uh, in two manners. One is one is to one experience creation. The second is, even before the person has entered your portal, your entire outlet, it's extremely important for you to do the homework right. And the homework is in the realm of analytics. So today we use a lot of analytics, which are not uh, straightforward analytics, but cross-pollinated analytics. So if I'm looking at uh, a kid's terrain, I'm really looking at multiple pieces of data. Now school data is not very commonly available in public domain, even though there are public schools which actually put out uh, data which is available in a discrete format. Uh, you pollinate that with health data. You pollinate that with uh, the, the credit card data of whoever has actually used the credit card at the location. At this point of time, those three pieces of data, or kids' accounts in banks, you know, uh, so there are lots of kids' accounts in banks. And the size of those kids' accounts and the periodicity of use itself is a great way. So my record typically is two things. One is do your homework right, get in the right kind of people into your outlet. You don't really need the wrong ones. And once you've got them, give them those great experiences. To get the right kind of a customer in, it's cross-pollinated analytics, great thing to use. Please do not smirk at analytics as we have typically smirked at analytics uh, in most retail formats, okay? The older retail formats, not the newer ones. Newer guys are more excited. And once you've got the guy in, give them those blissful, delightful experiences because of which they'll walk back in. And Disney is a classic example of those experiences. Right, Shankar, I'll, I'll take uh, that piece of the experience and the fact that a relationship is um, more important as far as the customer goes than purely the product or service. So eventually, to try and cash in on those, uh, people start thinking of, prepaid, gift cards, loyalty, you know, through cards and so on. But how does one take it to the next generation, the next level of these? Uh, because today, if I look at my wallet, I've got some 40 cards. And I don't even know when I put one of those 40 to use. And half the time, they just expire. And then you're like, okay, damn, it was never worth it. So, you know, the challenges from a consumer standpoint as well. I uh, appreciate that very much. That last point that you made makes a lot of sense from a consumer's world. Most of us are overloaded with uh, various kinds of loyalty programs. In my experience with brands over so many years, I can quite unequivocally tell you that the ones that work best are the credit card loyalty programs, probably the airline loyalty programs, and maybe the hotel ones. The mono-brand loyalty programs are a psychological crutch for a retailer to believe that they have their consumer's loyalty. A few programs work fantastically well. For example, the first Citizens Club of Shopper Stop or the inner, inner circle of lifestyle. Those work pretty well. That's largely because the consumer loves choice. Harish mentioned something a little earlier where he talked about people being promiscuous, brand promiscuous, and that is true. It is absolutely true. I think if we search hard enough within ourselves, we'll all believe that and we'll all appreciate the truth in that. By that very statement, we are negating the concept of loyalty. So what our organization is actually trying to do 
is to bring out a very simple, basic philosophy, which is called prepaid, like I, like I expounded on a little earlier. It actually is a manifestation of loyalty which cannot be argued with. The only reason that I would, let's say, buy a Shopstop gift card or an Amazon.in gift card and gift it to someone is when I love the brand. That means I'm loyal. And that means I'm getting you another customer who likely will be loyal. Now, there are arguments to and uh, for and against, let me say. I appreciate uh, my colleagues on the panel having said things like analytics, data, etc. There's also a great challenge in getting that data in. And there's a lot of challenge in actually making that data work. Because all of us are suffering today from information overload. Ask any manager in any retail company, he's suffering from information overload. He is not able to process that data. It's funny that you say that because before I got in, I was reading a bit and one of the quotes said, well, they told me that I was a loyal customer and then they started sending me hate mail because they got so much of email in their inbox about how to go about using the loyalty points that they had. And I think this is a real uh, experience today. I mean, if Gmail hadn't made our uh, promotions a separate column, I mean, we would be on that delete button morning to evening, Harish. Uh, so, absolutely. Differentiation. Sh uh, Shelly, differentiation is it. And then unfortunately, you know, as he's talking about, Shankar's talking about these monocards which don't work. He's absolutely right, they don't work. So what are we trying to do? What's the solution? In fact, I'm a dirty guy in this business because I go to guys and tell them, you know, hey, listen, there is something called a loyalty card. Forget loyalty cards. Create something called a promiscuity card. What is a promiscuity card? It's your phone number. It's your mobile phone number. Why must I carry 40, 40 different cards in my pocket? Now, number portability is in. The mobile phone is the future. So, if you go and walk into an Aditya Birla more, uh, all they need is your mobile phone card, your mobile phone number, and your points get credited to your mobile phone. So at the end of the day, the e-wallet, the mobile wallet, the m-wallet, and, and the ability to spend from that m-wallet, ability to earn on that m-wallet, is all going to come in. So loyalty cards, yeah, some are successful. Uh, Shopper Stop card is successful. Most are not. So the promiscuity card is the future. Let's, let's find out how brands are actually going to incorporate some of those thoughts that we just discussed. So we'll, we'll come back to you there, Abhishek. Just give us a sense of how, how are you approaching this space? Are you being cautious? Are you trying to embrace that? And of course, you know, like uh, everyone's talking about prepaid. Some brands, it does wonders. But then at the end of the day, when you're checking out and you see 400 different brands, you're like, okay, forget it, you know? Yeah. So differentiation there from brands' point of view. couple of different points being discussed here. I think the one is about data. And uh, so I think everything that's, you know, it's, uh, you, you can't argue against everything that has been said. Data is extremely important. But I think the, and every company, which whether it's a retailer, brand, whatever, needs to embrace it because that is the future. But the core purpose of why, you know, this whole quest to getting, collecting data, knowing, started with the fact that you want to know your customer. You want to personalize the experience that you, uh, you are able to give to that customer and therefore delight that customer. That, you know, if someone were able to, you know, if someone were able to, you know, almost guess what is it that would delight me, what is it that I'm, I as a customer am looking for and be able to provide that based on whatever information they have about me and make my life easier, right? At the end of the day, all of these experiences are about making customers. That, was, that is the single unique purpose of collecting all of this data, analyzing all of this. And I think that is a, that is a long journey. I think very few companies, very few brands have really been able to figure out. And I think in that journey, there are you know, many, many a pothole. And you know, we've, we're, we talked about some of those that in your quest for collecting and making customers' life inconvenient, you're actually making it inconvenient. Uh, but you know, it is something that needs to be done. Brands and companies need to figure that out. I think the second point that was made was, uh, that we discussed was around the whole, uh, the notion of emotional connect, right? Now, you know, data and, you know, the ways of doing that, understanding your customer are all eventually ways, ways of getting to that emotional connect. But, you know, there are different companies that have approached it differently. And I'll just give you one example again, you know, having the privilege to work for a company like Disney. I think the, 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 the way the company approaches something like an emotional connect, just a uh, quick sort of anecdote. So the way, you know, if, if you're in a Disney theme park, Right, which is in some ways the ultimate brand, brand experience. And if you are, a, you know, you have those height charts for certain rides, right? So it's, you know, whatever, four feet, nine inches or whatever. So if you're a kid, you're a family, you know, of two kids, two adults, whatever, you know, the youngest kid is somehow not able to get into that ride. You are, you, you've que queued up for half an hour, 40 minutes, you get to the front of the line, you can't get, the, the youngest kid can't get into the ride. Mm -hmm. You know, the way the staff is trained there that immediately the usher will take that kid, 
they'll let the family go, they'll take that kid to the shop, which is always a shop as soon as you exit any of these rides, print out a height chart, you know, give the kid that height chart with a character, give him a small goodie, and, you know, say that, you know, you know and it's, it's, all, it's printed like a certificate, saying that, you know, as soon as you get into, you know, get to this height, we will, you know, and you're here, the next time you will be first in queue to, to get onto this ride. And I bet you, that eight out of 10 of those kids actually stick that high height chart in their rooms and measure themselves against that. Right. And the whole family comes back right. the year so or the next year. I can year. see so it's, Akshay it's is nodding his head. So he, he's, <laughs> he's made a mental note of that idea. It yes. may just work for his <laughs> children's museum for sure. No, but you know, I want to take uh, Akshay, you to the idea of storytelling as well. Something that again, Sanjeev talked about that at the heart of what they want to do, they try and project that this is the greater common good or, you know, it, it's the thing to do. So it, it's a philosophy. How do you build a philosophy and how do you keep uh, up with it to keep that brand uh, loyalty? Because again, philosophies have to be differentiated as well. So that, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, that's a very good question, especially um, if you want to try and retain the brand status that you've created. So just as quick background, Stella Children's Museum is um, an edutainment space uh, where we try and get uh, kids to learn through play. And so really the idea about bringing, building loyalty is, can we continue to keep the focus on learning through play? And I can give you examples of where we've had to fight that um, with, for example, uh, you know, we, we do, we've done birthday parties and a lot of kids come in and, and you know, they enjoy the space and time at the museum. Um, but we, every once in a while, get uh, someone from Delhi, an, a, a mom in Delhi, who wants to have her children dance to Bollywood music. And uh, we put our foot down and we say, look, that's not part of the brand. So we want to be loyal to what we want to promote. Similarly, uh, we get corporate sponsorships, right? And for us, it's a strict no-no to go to a corporate that I would not want my child to experience at a young age. Remember, we are talking to kids between the ages of two to 10, so Horlicks is fine, Dettol is fine, Coca-Cola is not, right? Um, and so that's part of the philosophy of maintaining that brand image. So your customer knows every time they enter into Stella Children's Museum, the child will be exposed to the right product. Okay, I just want to get in one more question with you, which is that, are you spending too much time, time thinking about what you want in this case, or are you really going with what the customer wants? Because I'm guessing a kid comes and says, can I get a, a fizzy drink? So I, I just want to know that because if, even though it's your philosophy, if the consumer is at the center of it, how do you, how do you dodge that or manage that? Sure. So Shelley, we uh, are part of the Association of Children's Museums, uh, which is an international organization. And uh, the association has sort of guidelines on what should be good and what should not be good. And to be fair, these aren't anything that are too paternalistic. Uh, they are what I would call common sense issues. Uh, and so yes, it may seem slightly paternalistic to not allow kids to dance to bo Bollywood music in Delhi. Uh, but you know, it is things that transcend from that philosophy, the overarching you know, children's museum philosophy. So we, we were talking about the advocates at some point, you know, people who are actually going to become the ambassadors of your products. I, I don't quite yet see this happening at a serious scale in India. Uh, and even if it is, it's probably a very boutique brand. Now, how do you try and achieve that? And Sanjeev, is there an effort that you're making towards it? Because you have a space, uh, you know, any kid's space is a very easy word of mouth story. It can make or break it. So how are you trying to channel or use that channel to your favor? Let me go back uh, to the previous point and to the previous point, which was data. We are saying, what does a customer want? We are going by the traditional method of data collection and then getting a feedback. Let me give you an example of what we do. We have, like in any other city, we have a governing council. Internationally, it is known as a Congress, but for sensitivity purpose, we call it a council here. So we went to most of the schools and they said, we want you to nominate certain amount of children from each school who will then go through a selection process which involved group discussions, essay writing, all through an accredited external agency. And we got thousands of applications from which we selected 30 children who basically formed the governing council of Kitsania. So it is they who determine 
what is their likes, preferences, feedback, and what they would like, of course, within the overall philosophy and guidelines. So that's the best of all. We have the customers who really rule, and they determine what we should do within our overall realm. So I think that's the best form of actually having our customers being the brand ambassadors by them being in the driver's seat. Okay, so one thing is clear that, you know, the ecosystem of goodwill must be created at all points by these brands as they look at new opportunities. So let's come back to the idea of, you know, goodwill and prepaid cards because the minute you manage to reach a certain level of goodwill, people start picking up those prepaid cards and they believe that gift cards, you know, is, uh, is a reflection of who they are, their philosophy and so on. What kind of trends do you see there? Now, I'll give you an example of a gift card that I got about a month ago. It was a gift card to give away in a charity. So, and it was of an organization in America, it was a brand. The question is, are we reaching that level or are we still saying, no, I, I want it for myself. It's, it's selfish, not selfless, you know what I mean. That's a, a lovely question, thank you. It also harks back to what Harish said in the earlier part of the presentation about the suspended coffee. It's something that I've come across abroad. Um, and I'll be very proud to tell you this, even if it's a little bit of you know, trumpet blowing here. We have a subdivision in our company called giftbig.com. It's an e-commerce venture which uh, aggregates gift cards and gift vouchers of all the top brands in India, offers them for sale to the consumer. We've done a very small effort towards charity by creating an Enable India uh, gift card. Uh, that is a, a, a brainchild of my colleague who's sitting there quietly in the audience. His name is Pratap, co-founder of the company. Um, Enable India gift card is actually available. You can actually give it away to charity. I must tell you that Amazon.in also does a very nice job of one thing. You can actually log on to Amazon and a certain portion of the purchase that you make is actually given away to your favorite charity. Mine happens to be Compassion Unlimited plus action for animals. And I always buy something from Amazon.in and I make sure that a little bit goes to them because they can do with all that they can receive. I think the other, to answer the other question about how do you, you know, transcend and how do you connect with consumers into the long term, consumers only become advocates of a brand when, they have, when the brand has reached love mark status in the consumer's mind. It's not an easy task. A lot of it harks back to the earlier days of retailing, long before it was data-driven and computer-driven. The earlier days of retailing, why do you go to your Kirana shop? Why does a Kirana shop actually coexist in India today along with a multi-branded hyper-city or one of the super hypermarkets? It's only because there is a certain personal connect. Humans are social animals. We require that personal connect. Right, and let me catch you there on that one because again, um, although there is a separate session on the idea of omni retail and omni channel so on, but you know, I'd be very curious to know how can gift cards really uh, somewhat string together that idea as well because I mean, you know, coupons too uh, are, are sort of a gift card at one level and uh, sooner or later these gift cards won't be plastic, they will remain, uh, you know, virtual. So how do you kind of piece that entire experience together? Uh, is something that the gift card needs to tell a person who's picking it up, right? So it's, it's a little bit like creating a chain reaction. I love a brand, I gift it, whether in electronic form or plastic form or paper form is immaterial. In fact, our organization can do all three. So t tomorrow, like Harish said beautifully, the, the future is the mobile. The kids today are accessing the world through the mobile. Uh, access of internet is also through the mobile. Purchasing is through the mobile. Seamless, frictionless payments are through the mobile. Now today we have created a mobile application which will go live in a couple of months where you will actually be able to gift your friend sitting, I'm sitting here in Bangalore, my friend is sitting in New Delhi, it's her birthday tomorrow, I can't physically reach a card to her. Today I can go on the net and I can buy her an e-gift card, can reach her on her email and she can be at the shop and actually burn it on the spot. So this kind of thing creates consumer advocacy. Okay, Harish, so let's pick up the, the ideas here. One is, uh, the, are we still thinking gift cards and products or are we, are we going beyond that? I mean, barring the most obvious, which is salon coupons and salon cards, are talking a little more sort of high-end experiences. Uh, are we talking of that kind of a space in the first place at all? When I look at the numbers in the gift card category within the country, the numbers are smaller at this given point of time. But bulk of the gift cards are about items I can actually eat, actually wear, actually keep for myself. Because essentially it's about I, me, myself. We are essentially, and some of it is cosmetic, some of it climbs up into cosmetics. 
but a few of them are about family, you know, the entire family. So it's after I, it's my family of four, and after my family of four is the community. The community cards are far and few. I mean, I'm extremely thrilled to hear of these efforts, uh, but the point is, you know, India is still not self-actualizing. We are still in the roti, kapda, makan kind of a uh, situation. So till we self-actualize, these are going to be very exciting anecdotal thoughts. Uh, the numbers are going to be small. Uh, but the important thing to understand is modern retail caters to modern people, highly modernized, modernistic people. And these modern, modernistic people are hedonists, essentially. After they've crossed that hedonistic level, these guys are going to move on to a level where they're going to self-actualize. At that point of time, people are going to say, hey, listen, I cannot, actually, very frankly, I cannot um, drink uh, five Pepsis a day. I'd love to, but I can't because, you know, I don't want to get to be a diabetic at a point of time. Sorry, Pepsi. Uh, but the point is, I would like to drink one and give four to others because what I can't eat, let me give it away to others. I have the same theory on food channels. Why is it that food channels are proliferating on television in a huge manner? Even what I cannot eat myself, I eat with my eyes. So it's a question of saying, you know, I'll walk into retail, but we haven't reached that stage. But I guess we will. When, you know, modern retail users are going to get more uh, self-actualizing. So, you know, uh, we're already at 11 and I don't want to delay the next session anyway, so I'm going to just wrap this up in five minutes and take two questions. But Harish, just one point, uh, and this is a little bit what you had said while you were presenting. We all go back to thinking money. And here we're talking about creating brand loyalty and experiences, which is an investment. How is the toss-up between the investment and the cost factor? Oh, uh, my toss-up with most retailers or most franchisees or franchise owners is very simple. Uh, everybody is bothered about the bottom line, full stop. And that's how businesses must run. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, you must run your business sustainably uh, by making just about a wafer thin margin, if at all, or a small loss. Uh, but at the same time, you must be investing ahead of the curve on experiences. Okay. So the theory simply is that if you're making a loss of X, uh, you know, and uh, you, you want to make an investment, my reco is make an investment of about 12x uh, ahead of the curve. Don't go berserk and make 100x because that's going to be bad. But 12x is a reasonably good uh, rule of thumb. Okay, Sanjeev, would you buy that theory? Not totally in agreement with that. I think it's very difficult to define, in, that, uh, sort of define in terms of multiples. But uh, I do agree that it's an investment. Now, what the gestation period of that investment is, that's something which is a different subject matter. Uh, it but can I do question feel survival. We to, yes, I do feel okay. we have to invest. There has to be a certain time span. One has to have a certain economies of scale. One has to have a certain critical mass. And then the commercial returns will follow. Okay. But I would not like to sort of put it into any specific multiples. Okay. Uh, you know, Shaili, my only issue with 12x multiple is that when I examine retail businesses in India, uh, I've seen retail businesses with 40x, okay? You're making a loss of x, and your actual invest in year on year is 40x. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's not a business that's going to sustain itself. Right. Your number really said that only 5% of them float up. That's why 5% of them really float so up. Saying, sensible businesses, risk. calculated, yeah. sensible businesses don't go ahead of the curve and do stupid things. Okay, cool. So, uh, Abhishek, uh, would you think that the idea of prepaid could be game-changing to your... Uh, you know, your, your future in the short term and that this would truly uh, change things for Disney in a country like India? You know, I... Uh, uh, unlikely in, uh, is the one word answer because, uh, you know, like I said, you know, our... I think prepaid is an evolving model. It's certainly a model which is the discussion we were having that makes a lot of sense for the sellers. It's the only negative margin product you have in retail, which, you know, not negative margin, sorry, negative working capital product. So it's great makes a whole lot of sense. It changes that equation completely if you can sell more of these. I think for us as a brand, I think the, you know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the foundational elements is the, the trust that you can, uh, you know, that a consumer places in us. And you, since that is a foundational element, I'm not so sure that prepaid in and of itself, in the way that it works, uh, is something that we are going to embrace at this point in time. I, I thought the argument from uh, Shankar's point was that it's actually trust that drives prepaid, but how would you like to take that? I maintain that trust uh, is driven by prepaid. The reason is it's only when a consumer trusts a brand that he or she buys into it right. and then becomes an advocate of it. It is one of the avenues of advocacy. 
It's not the only means of advocacy, it's one of the avenues and it works. F quick comments, Akshay, from you as we wrap this up and then we can get a couple of questions in. Uh, I actually think uh, for children's museums worldwide, about 20 to 30 percent of footfalls into a children's museum are by members. So really the gold standard is to get a lot of people to buy in for the year ahead right. and get them to come again and again and engage right. with the museum. So for us, I think the way to go for us, the green, you know, the, the golden standard would be to get more prepaid. Uh, and that could then eventually allow you to even come up with a brand experience for those. Okay, let's get a couple of questions. That's the kind of time we have if somebody can uh, take the mic around. Any questions out there? Are you going to leave it for me to take? We've got one right here in front. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anik Banerjee. My question is to Mr. Harish Biju. I mean, you have talked about uh, something about your third tweet, that brands are becoming macro. I mean, they're all generic. So I would, uh, is, does, does that really mean, and also you talked about brand love, does that mean that product differentiation is, is going out of communication or? Mm. So, uh, so that's a very good question. Uh, I would definitely say that product differentiation is not going out of uh, fashion. Uh, you start with product differentiation. First of all, you start with your own product. Then you start differentiating your product against someone. But many of us in this space get so besotted with competition that you're differentiating only against that competition. Now, that is very short-sighted because, you know, that fight is forever. And that fight is a margin bleed fight which is continuous. You have to rise above the entire category. And the way to rise above the category is possibly become that much more umbrella, that much more macro, and so that you know there is no other competitor who's going to go after you. Because retail is a high bleed arena, as all of us are familiar with. Few more questions? No learners out there? Some questions? Great. My question is for Mr. Maheshwari. See, Disney is into production houses, media, products, merchandise, themes parks, amusement, creating customer experience. How do you manage this portfolio without losing the brand value and your brand theme? So, you know, when I, when I started, we had this, uh, you know, with this thought that we don't view ourselves as any of, we don't view ourselves as a television business or a studio business. We view ourselves as, a, as an intellectual property business. Because at the core of all of these things is the intellectual property, the storytelling, the characters, all of that, which, you know, and those things can come alive, whether it's in a, you know, in an experience in a theme park or a movie or a television channel or a consumer product or a digital experience, all of those things. So, the, you know, if... You know, within Disney, we believe we are an intellectual property company, and that's what keeps it together. And these are all mediums, and the mediums keep changing, will change, will evolve as technology evolves. Thank you. Okay, um, I think if one were to rate uh, the idea of brand experience, each one of you would end up giving it a 10 on 10 in terms of the priority list, wouldn't you? Right, at this stage, yeah. I think, I think it's been an interesting, insightful discussion to get a perspective on now. Uh, well, the toss-up between how much of the brand experience needs to be driven by prepaid or otherwise, and which story really starts first. What is your point A? And then on, uh, you know, converting it into point B. But I really appreciate my panel's uh, very honest insights, uh, and hopefully everyone has taken away a bit from there. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure having you here on the stage with me. Thanks.